Hey, welcome in to the Penn Live Wrestling Podcast, our very first episode. Dustin Hawkinsmith here. I'm joined by Dave Heckard. For the first will be a weekly edition of this show. Dave's going to share some thoughts with us every Monday. And the plan will be to break down the latest in the mid-pen and touch into the District 3 scene as well. Uh, the Penn Live Wrestling Podcast will also feature some interviews with coaches and wrestlers, some other analysis all season long. So I would definitely encourage you to subscribe to it. You can do that on Spotify, Apple, and iHeartRadio. So we're in a lot of platforms where we need to be. Dave, first of all, welcome in. I'm super excited to have you on board. And I think wrestling fans in this area, we don't really have anything like this. And we certainly don't have anything with somebody like you to, to kind of share your thoughts. 17 years coaching at Cumberland Valley. You were a state champion yourself. You coached, I think, four state champions. I, I can't think of anybody better to break down what's happening around here. No, thanks for having me, Dustin. I'll tell you, I, I got to... I really, really wanted the introduction. I, every every time I come on, <laughs> listen, you laugh, but I wanted the introduction to be the chicken dance theme song. I think that would have been outstanding. And, uh, you know, we, we couldn't do that because of uh, some some different uh, different different loopholes and whatnot. But either way, no, good 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 to have me. And uh, I think uh, this is going to be pretty neat here to to get out and kind of just share different perspectives on on the season and and kind of keep everybody up to date with what's going on in mid pen. So. Here's what I'll say about the chicken dance. All right. So first of all, the technic there's technicalities in terms of what can be used and what can't be. So that's first and foremost. But I respect you for wanting to dive into that because you know, like I don't think if, if you're putting if you're putting a list together of say the top ten moments of your coaching career, that moment probably wouldn't be on that top ten. But I I respect the fact that you're willing to confront that. I mean, it would definitely be like the most memorable. I, I, I can say that, and, and, you know, yeah, for sure, for sure. Well, uh, we are going to launch into the season ahead. Uh, we'll probably talk about the chicken dance, I, I assume, at some point in time, which I don't know. I, I think that's pretty – I don't know if we need to really get launched into the details of that. I think that's nah, – when you say nah, Dave, you say Dave Hecker good. chicken dance, most people will kind of get it. But we're going to we're gonna start on our very first episode here just looking back at the 2020-2021 season. It was so unique and so difficult and challenging in all these different ways. And I, I fully grasp that there are much bigger things going on in the world, especially at that time than, than wrestling. But I, I do think it's worth discussing just how hard that was on people like you, on your wrestlers. And, you know, first I want to go back to the beginning of it and let's go back to, all right, the state championships and you get into this off season and it seems like, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a real have versus have not situation when it comes to, you know, the really, really good clubs that, that you can uh, wrestle in and the programs that don't have maybe one of those elite clubs nearby. And I felt like this off season, you know, you had to kind of send kids out on their own more so than usual. And I think that have versus have not thing was, was exaggerated a little bit. Just walk me through, um, not really knowing when preseason begins exactly yeah, what's going to walk yeah. through your doors. No, I, I think like you said it, you know, from the start, I, I, your wrestling season is, is and, and any, any high school athletic season has its challenges, you know, um, from top to bottom. But I think, you know, obviously this season or this past season with COVID just made things a lot more challenging. And it's interesting you bring that up. I was, I was in a, uh, it was a preseason wrestling, like steering com committee meeting. And, and you even might've been there. It was that Cumberland Valley? And, uh, and, and Dave Gable, who, who's the head coach of Dallas Town, outstanding human being. I mean, just an awesome guy. And him and I had gotten the conversation about preseason, how he like coming into the preseason without the guys doing anything like all summer, the, you know, before the COVID year, um, how far back your, your guys were and not necessarily your wrestlers. I mean, every team has guys who wrestle and you have wrestlers and, and you need both, right? Like, you know, your wrestlers per se, the, the uh, you know, his son at, at the time was going to be a senior. Like, you know, those guys, the, the Jake Lucases of the world that they went out and they did things and they found ways to, to do that. And uh, you came into the preseason and, and the guys that don't necessarily you know, do the wrestling year round per se. Uh, you know, your your guys who wrestle were the guys that you really saw, man, the, the growth was really stunted from from the previous year to, to that preseason. And, uh, you know, like, like Dave had said, you know, I, he was like, you know, the guys didn't get a whole lot better because of that time they took off. And, and, uh, and, and I think that was relative across the board, like you had said, uh, the, the guys who, who don't have access to, to the big clubs. And 
I mean, maybe so, maybe that's fair to say, but I, I think like the have and have nots, like, you know, your, your guys who, who it's important to found a way to go out and, and work hard and, and to try to keep up as much as possible. And, and the guys who didn't obviously didn't. So, um, but I, I think that, you know, from, from top to bottom, I, I think people did the best that they could last year, you know, with, with what you had. And I, and I think, you know, even, even starting the year, uh, okay, we're, we're going to be wrestling with masks on. It's like, wait, wait a second. We're, we're going to go out on the mat and, and really get into like a physical altercation with somebody. You're, you're going to physically assault another person, but we have to wear masks. So it was, it was a challenge. But you know what? At the end of the day, uh, one of my biggest worries was how is that going to be handled from an official's perspective at the beginning of the year? And then when you get to states, how's it going to be handled? I mean, you know, you start conjuring up all these different scenarios that can happen. And and in reality, I think that the officials and the PIAA did a pretty darn good job, um, you know, with, with trying to do the best that they could and and while adhering to, to any precaution to try to keep people safe. So, um, yeah. I I thought, you know, from my personal perspective, I thought wrestling in masks was going to be a much bigger disaster than it actually was. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I, 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 re- I recognize the, the potential for inconsistency, and you did see that, but I thought it was going to be a lot worse. And I think, I mean, from your experience, you know, I think the resilience of, of the kids showed up. You know, and I think the the st- the strategy of coaches showed up to you know to really wrestle and practice with these on, just accepting that these are our circumstances. Let's if we want to make the most of these circumstances, yeah, we got to get used to wrestling in this mask. And then, you know, certainly the scene did change toward the the postseason when you started intermingling with other districts, other places where the masks weren't as important to uh, coaches, administrators, etc. Uh, right. But it did change. But it, it was you know I, I really thought it was a testament to. To, um, the kids themselves for working through that. Yeah, and you know it's funny. Last year we started the season, and I got this idea like we're gonna we're gonna try to we're gonna try to harness this thing. And we we took like the the broken nose mask, like we bought a bunch of them, and then we put like you know over the mouth, like the cover, and and it ended up being a complete failure. I mean the masks were coming down in kids' faces, and it was like okay, we just spent a couple hundred dollars, scrap that. Okay, now we're gonna throw these masks on, and and really like you you had said earlier. You know, we entered practice and it was like, listen, here's the deal. We're wearing the masks. I, I remember having this conversation with my team. I'm standing there in front of my team and, you know, hey, we're going to wear these masks. And, and as I'm talking, I'm getting annoyed by the masks. And I'm going, I don't want to hear any complaining. We're going to wrestle hard. There's no complaints. Well, by the end of it, like, I'm, I'm, I'm annoyed with my own mask. So, so speech one, here I am telling the kids, I don't want to hear any complaining. And here I am complaining about this mask, you know, but really the kids were incredible. And not, not, not just my own. I mean, across the board, I, you know, the coaches said how kids came into practice and listen, you're going to wear them because you're going to have to wear them in a match. So you might as well get used to it here, you know, and, uh, and they did, they, they, they wore them and, and did the best they could in the room to, to keep them up and, and do what they needed to do. So uh, a testament to the to the coaches, the you know the officials, but really the kids, man. I I thought the kids did an outstanding job on that. So, and I, I think you know just the mentality being out there, you know, and it's just one more thing, you know. I, I I've talked to you about this before about just the brutal and difficult nature, and and this is your quote to me on several occasions. Everything about wrestling is hard. Yeah. You know, it's just yeah. one more thing. And I know all winter athletes were going through it. I know every, yeah. uh, you know, other athletes in other sports were going through it, but it's just that one extra thing in the sport of wrestling that just felt like such a big ask that, you know, sometimes I think kids are more resilient than adults are, you know, they handled it. Oh, yeah. you, 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 you see the types of people out there who are making a lot of fuss about this going to the grocery store. And here you have a kid wrestling six minutes, getting beat up. He's bloodied his eyes bleeding. He's taped above the forehead and he's still wearing that mask. I mean, if they can do it, why can't we? Right. Right. No, I'm de- definitely right there, man. And, and uh, a testament to them. And, but guess what? Like this year uh, it's a new year and, and we know we don't have to wear them this year. So the kids wrestle at least, you know, at least have a little relief from that. And, uh, you know, not as much on the coaches to try to police all that. And yeah, I mean, it's going to be definitely a better season with that. So, and administrators too, because the, if you recall, we'll move on from the mask, but if you recall, like the the PIAA didn't have a universal 
policy for how to handle if you had a mass dispute. So it it ultimately ended up falling, I believe, on athletic directors to go out there and intervene if they see something. Who's going out of their way to do that? Yeah, nobody. And and it worked out. And and again, at the state tournament, which was really, I I, you know, your biggest concern, like you know, you have all these different areas who are policing it differently. What's going to happen when they all? you know, assimilate and come together, you know what I mean? And, and how's that going to be handled, you know? And I thought they did a great job at the state tournament and uh, yeah, I mean, just kind of let you, you do your thing. So. Speaking of the state tournament, the other adjustment um, and there were, were a couple that I really want to touch on, but the other adjustment is when you get into the individual postseason, the one day tournament and, you know, trust me, no, nobody wanted to be in that situation, but, you know, they had to create a situation where um, the number of entrants was down, that you could get this thing done in one day. And that goes for the sectional, district, regional, and the addition of the super regional, in addition to the state tournament. It ended up just being a really tough road for a lot of kids, especially, out, you know, District 3 and the way the state was set up, that the super region was with the Whippeal kids and, and a lot of kids who, you know, you look out east, for example, east of us, the District 11, and you had a bunch of kids who were nine and one, you know, at the end of the regular season, and they're going into the postseason with that. Then you look out west, and you have kids who were 40 and seven. You know, you could, you could see the differences in the regions um, going that way. But uh, what was the adjustment when it is a one-day tournament? Well, when you I, do I, have, I've got to be honest. Yeah, I, I got to be honest. And, and uh, you know, as far as the sectional tournament um, for triple A anyway, I mean, I, I, per, I like the eight man bracket. I mean, you know, every other sport in high school, I, I don't care if it's, if it's swimming track, every other sport, there is a standard to meet in order to be able to participate in the postseason. And, and wrestling is the only one that, that there's not. So, I felt like happening at eight guys. Uh, yeah, you're going to hear a lot of people say, "Oh, well, what about you know?" Th- that's more mat time for for other guys. You know, you're you're taking away from the sport. Well, guess what? When you hit the postseason, that's about the upper level guys. You know what I'm saying? And 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 I, I feel like, hey, let's let's trim the fat here. Are the guys going to be upset that they don't get in at numbers nine, ten, eleven? I mean, I'm sure there, there's guys that are going to be. And and you know, you're going to have coaches that say, "Well, uh, yeah, well, I had an 11 seed one time that that broke through and, and qualified." And, and yeah, I. I get all that. Um, but I mean, at the end of the day, I think you got to tend to the upper level guys when it comes to the individual postseason and, uh, you know, having one way in, you know what I mean? And, and guys not having to wrestle, you know, pigtail matches. And, you know, I, I just think uh, your, your, your upper seeds anyway, not having to wrestle pigtail matches. I just thought it, it went really smooth. And, um, you know, what, what are numbers nine to 11 doing in the individual postseason anyway? You know, I, I mean, where are we going with that? So, I liked it. I know they're going back to, uh, to allowing more uh, this year, which is fine. Um, but man, after sectionals and, and then in the districts, um, you know, it, it became ultra difficult. And then, and then once it hit the super regional, as you know, out in Altoona, I mean, here we are, we're going through this, this whole thing and we're going to add the super regional. Well, we're going to load up. We're going to go out to Altoona, which was like taking a, a you were like going back to 1994, you know what I mean? And you go into this gym and, and I mean, you know, the level of competition, man, from, from, from that super region. I mean, I, I, I went back and did some homework. I mean, seven, seven weight classes had reappearances of the finals from super regionals in the state finals, seven. Um, That's unbelievable. Uh, um, unbelievable. And, and, and I mean, there was only one weight class at the state tournament that was not represented by any of the finalists in the West super region. And that was 160 where, uh, the condominium kid from Northampton and the McGill kid from Springford wrestled. Every other weight class, there was at least one representative from the super region in seven of them. It was a final rematch in four of those. The finals were reversed. You know what I mean? Where they, the yeah. one guy won in the super region and the next week, those out- that outcome was reversed. Um, so, you know, I mean, the, the level of, uh, of competition came coming from that super region out in Altoona was just, through the roof. And, uh, you know, even, even for us, I mean, we took three guys and I mean, in, in reality, uh, I, I felt like there was really only, I mean, we knew there was one guy getting through and, and, uh, you know, as, as, as tough as we might've thought those other guys were in reality, um, they just, they weren't making it. And, uh, you know, I, I it, it was tough and you saw a lot of good guys, uh, you know, sent home that weekend. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it was, it was, it was something, um, 
Who? So Gabe Belga, who he, did he wrestle Herrera Rondon out there? He Is did. That, did he? Yeah. He starts out. I was going to get this for you. I mean, he goes out at, at 152 and goes out and he gets the Maroon kid from Williamsport who beat him earlier in the year. So he gets that one. Well, then he goes and he wrestles Herrera the next match. Well, that, that doesn't go as well as, as planned. Well, then it ends up, man, he, he goes down and he wins another one. And then, and then I think he catches the kid from Connellsville who just, who just signed with uh, Pitt. And his, his name's Kessler. Kessler, right? Yes, Kessler, yeah. And who we watched wrestle. And earlier in the tournament, he goes and he wrestles uh, the, uh, the, the kid from Central Dolphin that beat Belga in the finals. Um, Buckman. Buckman, he wrestles Buckman, and I mean, completely dismantles Buckman. And we're sitting there watching it. And I'm going, well, you know, uh, maybe we got, you know, maybe the kid will get hurt in our match. I, I don't know. <laughs> and yeah. He goes out, and I mean, just completely dismantles us. And you know, that was what it was. I mean, we had the number one, number two, number three guy all in our our super region coming out of there. And uh, you know, although great experience for for the youngster there, uh, rally set in pretty quick. And uh, yeah. Well, I'll say this. I mean, there were two matches that that stood out to me that were, you know, the outcome was more or less inevitable. One was Gabe wrestling Herrera Rondon. But what yeah. I thought Gabe, and I said it to you whenever, whenever you guys walked off the mat, Herrera Rondon felt it. Like he felt Bel- Belga wrestling him. And I thought Belga showed up as well as you possibly could against a three-time champ who's at Oklahoma now. He's a sophomore out there. The other one was uh, Ryan Garvick from Central Dolphin wrestling Wyatt Henson. Uh, for yeah. Waynesburg, yeah. you know, yeah. Wyatt Henson is a next level guy too. He's an yeah. upper, upper, upper tier guy. And all you could really do with your guy, both cases here, young wrestlers is ask them to go out there and just make them remember you, right? Like go out make, battle, them, man. make them work. Go out and battle. Yeah. No doubt. No doubt. And uh, go out and give him a, give him a test, man. See what, see what he's got. And, um, and, and, you know, sometimes you get that out of younger guys a little more, maybe because they're, uh, I don't know, politically incorrect, dumber than the older guys, you know? So they'll go out there and, and not <laughs> about this much and go after it where, uh, you know, maybe, maybe the older guys, you know, reality is a little, a little, a little better for them. So, um, but no, I, I mean, I think that uh, when you have young guys like that wrestling, those upper tier guys, man, I mean, what are you, what are you going to do? You got to go out and, and, and give it a go. And, and I think you're going to see that Belga and Garvik are both going to have tremendous careers here moving forward. So um, absolutely. And, and, and probably a little bit better off from, from getting that feel and knowing, you know, just some confidence that, you know what, I mean, her Rondo had to work to beat me, you know, and you can, and you can maybe build on that. Yeah, uh, we can. will, we will, by the way, the one that you got through Jake Lucas, who won a state title, we'll talk more about him and, and that journey, not just this year, not just you and him, but his journey going back four years. And right. what it all took for him to get to the top of that state podium and how much he deserved it. We'll be doing that on episode two as part of, um, you know, looking more at the individual wrestlers from last year. Uh, the other dynamic here was moving the District 3 and the PIAA team championships around, wrestling the PIAA team championships after the individual championships. How big of an ask was that as a coach, you know, for all the different complexities, including guys who didn't wrestle through the individual postseason, guys who were knocked out of sectionals, having to try to keep them within arm's reach of their weight class so you can field a competitive dual team after the individual season's over? Yeah, I mean, you know... (laughs) there's something to that. And I know it was kind of crazy how you went like team districts before States, and then you went to individuals and then you came back and wrestled like the team state tournament at the end. But again, man, listen, I I, I feel like a lot of those teams competing at team States are going to have guys competing in the state tournament at the individual level, you know, and, and man, you know, there was a, (laughs) that's a three day tournament. I mean, even longer, really, if you consider the the, the prelims on Monday, Uh, but you're wrestling, you know, you know, Friday, Saturday, you know, I mean, it's, it's multiple weigh-ins. And so you're asking like these kids to weigh in for the team tournament and, and, and weigh in at different weights sometimes, right? Like sometimes they're going to weigh in light at one weight just to get a matchup here or there. Um, so you're going to ask them to weigh in multiple times at different weights the week before they start the individual tournament. And, and I just feel like, you know, you saw sometimes where some of the teams that went through that, um, you know, you can only get your team to peak so many times a year, you know, and, and that one time you definitely want your kids to is the individual tournament. And, uh, you know, sometimes you'd have kids peak at, at the state team tournament with their teams and then turn around and, you know, miss weight the next week. 
Uh, so sometimes they get hurt in the team tournament. Um, you know, and I just think that there's something to that. I, I, I liked the format of, of, of keeping the state team tournament till the end. I, I don't know the answer. I don't, I don't know how to keep kids uh, involved throughout that period of time where they're not wrestling, you know, where the individual tournament's going on. Uh, last year, we had a chance to go over and, and work out with Central Dolphin. I took Jake over because of being in Dapper Dan and they were still working out. And Jeff did a great job. I mean, you know, kind of let the kids come in and, and get a little workout in. I think, uh, you know, it might have been every day, but it was, it was short in practice. It was a little more light and just to get the weights down and, and kind of go. And I thought he did a great job with that. And it showed because they had a pretty good tournament. And, uh, you know, I, I think, though, although that might, might not be the right answer as far as exactly how it was done last year, there's something to that. And, and again, I, I think, you know, the, the key being getting kids to peek at the individual tournament um, before the before the state team, you know. And, and I think with that in mind, and you, I think you've been sort of on this side of the fence before, too, is um, – being accepting of your reality and, right. and understanding what are you subjecting your kids to if you're going to wrestle a team that clearly has you outmanned. You know, I know right. wrestling is a sport where, you know, you put it all on the line at all times, but, you know, I think you do have to kind of consider, is this worth it or not? Right. And I know that right. might, might be a taboo thing to say in wrestling circles, but when it comes to team versus individuals, you do as a coach have to kind of think about that. What are, what are you asking your kids to do and what's it going to cost me later? No. And I, I've, I've been on the, I've been on both sides. You know, I mean, I've been on, I've had teams before where I know these teams are, you know, we qualify for team States and we have no chance of, of placing, you know, I mean, we've, we've had teams where we had, we couldn't have passed, but you know, now we, we have a team where maybe qualifies for state team, but now like we're asking our kids to go way in two more times. Um, you know, to do something that, we're, you know, you're not going to do as a team. So then when you get into the number of weigh-ins and who's making weight at what weight, I mean, what's, like you said, what, what's, is it worth it? Like, you know, what's, what's the value in all this? And um, I, I've been on, on teams where, you know, we, we, we push for the state team tournament because let's be honest. I mean, if you have a team that you feel can place, you know what I mean? Well, then you're doing it. You know, you're going to go, yeah. you're going to put your team out there and you're going to make a go at it. But I mean, in reality, you know, most coaches know um, where they're at as a team and if they have a shot. And uh, for the teams that don't, like, what are we, what are we doing? I, I mean, really, like, I feel like in, in some way, shape or form, uh, you could get a committee of, of coaches and you could put together an eight team bracket. You could pick it. I mean, you don't have to win whatever. You could pick the eight best teams in double A eight best teams in triple A and you could run a one day team tournament. You know what I'm saying? And, and most likely the number nine team is going to be really mad that they didn't get in. But at the end of the day, the team that's going to win it is going to be one of the teams chosen. So um, I, I don't know. I, I just think there's easier ways to go about it and, and ways to kind of, you know, do the state team tournament and, and keep it at a, at a, a one day tournament. I think that would be a big advantage. So I, th I think I appreciate your ideas on these things more than the PIAA appreciates them. And, and more, more, it, you know, it seems more realistic in my viewpoint than, than to see this process change at all. And um, there yeah. is a participation element to it. And by the way, I mean, district three, you've been on the, this end of it before too, losing or, or finishing third in the district three team championship <laughs> and that task ahead of you don't go and have, having to go East to wrestle, you know, a six 30 match on a Monday against Bethlehem Catholic uh, yeah, that, yeah. you know, that, that you, you kind of, you know, in some case, you know, how it's going to go yeah, you go yeah, that's yeah. anyway. But you're doing it. I mean, you're doing it because you, you have to do it. You're not going to not show up. So you, you, you load your team up on a, on a bus. You take a two hour, two and a half hour trip. You're probably down a starter or two because you really know that you're not going to make them weigh in because the outcome's not going to matter anyway. And they're guys that are struggling with their weight. Maybe they're a little banged up. Maybe they just need a break. So what are you doing? Like, you know, so, all right, here we go. We're going to line load up on a bus. We're going to take a two hour trip uh, to go to go get pounded by a team. And that ends your, but again, you know, you're battling and, and you're in the district team tournament. What are you going to do? Not win. You're going to try to, yeah, I don't know. Um, so yeah, you know, you, you do, it, it is, it is. It is. Uh, Centered all last note here before we uh, we wrap up and we we kind of point our our arrow towards the individuals in the next episode. But uh, you mentioned Jeff Swagger, the job that he did with Central Dolphin, and you know what he did so well was long before the time came to buy into the team championship. 
he had his team bought in, you know, right. and I think that's probably, that is probably a statement over his 37 years in, in coaching that Swaggart has done as well as anybody in the state is getting his team to buy into the joint mission of his team. They bought into it. And I think especially early in the, in the team championships, the team that bought in the most and had, had their individual wrestlers buy in and, and weigh in close to what they did during the regular season had a tremendous advantage. And I thought that was the difference in them knocking off Bethlehem Catholic in that, what the quarterfinal round to get to, you know, Cumberland Valley and wrestle in the semifinals. Um, they run into that Waynesburg team, which I know, and maybe you can lend the voice of this is there is a conversation about where that Waynesburg team ranks among the great teams in Pennsylvania history. Not only were they tremendous, what with five, four or five state yeah, state six, champs, six, which is yeah, ab- absurd. Six place winners. Yeah. Six place winners they had. Yeah. I, you know, I think even the year, like we went through, like going through the super region, they went through, they had six medalists. Um, and and more would have been more would have meddled if they would have had a normal a normal year you know because they'd had more guys yeah. that probably would have would have done it you know and uh, you know yeah I mean they were they were just dynamite I I I'd put them up there I tell you what man they 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 didn't have I feel like they didn't have a hole I mean every everywhere there was somebody that was that was going to bring it and they were they were tough man and, and well coached and all the above I mean I, I I you know one of the best teams I've ever seen is that that Central Dolphin team of like 09 where they had like eight regional champions on their team. And uh, they were really tough that year too, as a, as a team, you know. And uh, but yeah, Waynesburg, man, they they were physical, they were they were mature, they were they they filled in every weight, uh, they spread out well. Um, they were tough, man. They were tough. Not only were they just objectively tough from top to bottom, you could not have asked for a worse matchup for Central Dolphin because every <laughs> area where every every weight they had a stud, Waynesburg had a better stud. Yeah, it was, and- it was impossible. And that, that is like wrestling is matchups, you know, especially when you're ca- talking dual meets and, you know, who's better than who? Well, I, you might, you might have a better team than somebody, but if they match up with you and, and catch the coin flip and you're done, I, you know, and, and it, it, it's all about matchups and, and Waynesburg, I mean, not just matched up with Central Dolphin, but matched up with everybody pretty well, I feel like. So um, they were, they were good, man, but uh, they lost some guys. So, uh, but they'll still have some, some tough guys coming back and, uh, That'll be interesting to see who jumps at the top this year uh, at the team tournament. So it's, it's a new year for them. It's a new year for us here with the Penn Live Wrestling Podcast. This is our very first episode. Appreciate you tuning in. We'll be here all season long. Dave will be joining us weekly to break down once the matchups begin. Also to look ahead to some of these divisions in the mid pen and to do our homework and to share what we think is going to happen in each of these divisions. So that'll be all be coming up in the coming weeks. Stay tuned with us all season long. You can subscribe and download episode episodes on Spotify, Apple, and iHeartRadio. For Dave Heckard, I'm Dustin Hawkinsmith, and we'll see you next time here on the Penn Live Wrestling Podcast. Easy enough, right? Yeah, yeah, good. Good, good, good. It's always, you know, you're always looking for...